Good morning. I come to you this morning feeling the heaviness of our nation. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray now for a spirit of peace. Father, pour out now your Holy Spirit on all flesh. Pour out the blood of the Lamb from corner to corner of this nation. Imbue me now with your spirit that I might speak with the same spirit with which your son turned over tables in the temple. The same righteous indignation that despises anything that opposes the name of the Most High God. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. There was a young black woman the age of 33 years old. She had worked a double shift and when she arrived home from having taken the bus, she stepped off feeling as though it had all been worth it. She was making her way up the short driveway to her very first home. It was a small three bedroom that she shared with her soon to be 18 year old son, Andre. Though exhausted, her angst began to rise up because there were no lights on in the home. I told that boy to leave the porch light on and I know he better had saved me something to eat. She made her way up the three stone steps leading into her home. She rang the doorbell over and over waiting for Andre to come to the door so that she could audibly tell him what she had situated in her mind through clenched teeth. When she got to her keys and pressed her way into the house, it was still. He is going to really get dealt with, she thought, because Andre was not home. She took her shower and still no Andre. She positioned herself in her chair right by the door so that when Andre came in, she could quickly grab him as she often did by his collar and threaten his existence. As she began to nod off, there was a knock at the door. This boy, now he done lost his key. She opened the door expecting to see Andre, but there stood a patrolman. Ma'am, do you have a son by the name of Andre Williamson? What has he done, she asked. Tell me what he's gotten himself into. I moved here to get him away from, and the officer said, ma'am, interrupting her. I'm sorry to inform you that he's deceased. All of a sudden, the ground quaked beneath her feet. She felt vomit push from the back of her throat, and a sudden flash of hotness filled her face. She began to collapse to the ground. The patrolman caught her and ushered her to that chair by the door. When she had come to, the patrolman simply said, I, I need you to travel with me now downtown to make an identification. Was he shot? Ma'am, let's get there and another officer will have the details. When they arrived at the morgue, some of Andre's friends fell on her breast and began to weep. What happened? What did you do? What was going on? And all of the boys were wearing masks pulled just below their chins. We were out protesting and the cops fired tear gas and we all started running and Dre fell and hit his head and then he was trampled. How did you boys even get involved in this? We were marching peacefully, Miss Williamson, because a kid from the neighborhood was murdered. Some organizers asked if we would participate. What organizers? Take me to them. But Miss Williamson, no, take me to them now. They made their way with her on foot to the Boys and Girls Club. There was a little light on in the back and the boys tried to restrain Andre's mother, but it was to no avail. She began knocking over everything in her path. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? She finally reached the man. She said, you organized this. You got my son killed. She screamed and she spat until her rage turned white hot and until the point that she could not see. And again, she collapsed to the floor. She awoke to a man putting a cold compress 
to her head. She was completely exhausted now and she could barely talk. How could you send those boys out to die? Yet here you are holed up in this office. You don't know my pain. You have no idea the pain that you have caused me. He said, ma'am, listen. The brother that set this in motion no longer works here with us. He went rogue and started doing his own thing some time ago. He simply uses our name. Secondly, I'm so very sorry for the loss of your son, but I want you to know that I do know how you feel. My son, too, was murdered. You see, a lynch mob formed and accused him of things that he simply didn't do, ma'am. They tortured my son to death. And here is something else I want to add. Much to my chagrin, there were people in the mob that I knew. So I respectfully ask that you don't tell me that I don't understand your pain. I want to talk to you very quickly this morning from a title, Where Is He? I don't have a, a tidy three-point sermon this morning as much as I'm going to deliver a homily that's rooted in realness. This mother represents every heart that believes upon the word of God, yet feels in the core of their being that somehow God is conspicuously absent as they are being tried. Her essence aches to discover that the one fashioned after her own flesh no longer breathes and no longer is found in the land of the living. She passes out because it is a representation of the overwhelming mental and psychological fatigue felt by those nauseated by fatalistic injustice in what is said to be the greatest country on the face of the earth. And as she makes her way to the morgue, I crafted the story such that she would not stay there long because it speaks to the desensitization over the pornography of black death in this country. She is steadfast in walking to the place where the boys tell her the organizer is in an effort to demonstrate that in the midst of the most horrific circumstances, our internal divine compass points to El Elyon, the Most High God, in search of an answer. It is also indicative of the segment of our personality that lays the responsibility of human tragedy at the feet of God. She screams, where is he? Because it reiterates the feeling that somehow God forsakes those whom he loves, particularly in the moments where our losses are egregious and inexplicably cruel. Where is he is really the articulative parallel of where is God when I need him the most. When someone says where is he, it is the linguistic equivalent of God. You promised that you would never leave me nor forsake me. When someone says where is he, it is W.E.B. Du Bois collective and blood curling scream from the souls of black folk that presses itself to the undercarriage of the third heaven and with one final breath says how can you let this happen again when she finally has an audience with this man he is found consoling her tending to the needs of her oxygen depleted body in other words the pain of her loss found her momentarily unable to breathe. Yet, here she is, seeking an answer. Her answer, as he gives it, is that the man truly responsible for the death of your child no longer works with us, but uses our name that is theologically interwoven into this story to demonstrate that every evil every temptation to steal kill and destroy every soul that's been stolen every contemptible act of amoral and immoral trespass committed with indifference to the divine right to live liberty and justice in what you call earth but what the spiritual regard as the first heaven has been carried out by the god of this world and so when it happens that she levies with the lips somewhat of akin to that of Job and his friends, the accusation or the accusatory posture that you don't know my pain, he can but respond, ma'am, I've lost a son. They tortured my son for things that he didn't do. 
They shed innocent blood and the intervening crescendo of his response is amidst the mob were people I knew. In other words, it was the people that believed that they were called by my name. It was church folk. It was the crowd. Some among them who had only days before celebrated his triumphant entry and now they yelled, crucify him. So when from within the hollows of your soul you say to me, I don't, I don't know your pain. That moment you felt the earth quake beneath your feet, I know all too well. You see, when they killed my son, my pain rent rocks in two. When my pain reverberated through the earth, the veil was torn in two. When my pain tore through the firmament, it darkened the sun. So don't tell me that I don't understand your pain. Text this morning comes from Psalm 34 and 18 where it simply reads, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart. There is undoubtedly calamity and chaos in the land. Justice is being denied a segment of the population that are all too often referred by the taxonomy American. But if you cannot understand the angst of the oppressed, if you cannot commiserate with the social exhaustion felt by the people of color right now, if your spiritual response is to be silent, then you are willfully ignorant and your soul is in peril. If one of the two great commandments is to love your neighbor as yourself, then whom among you wishes to have your life exterminated and find that the only measure of justice available to you is to become a hashtag on social media or the inspiration of a fading tattoo on the arm of someone that might find themselves dead soon as well. If you think that you can sit behind computer keyboards and rant until you feel better, if all you believe your part to do is to express your sincere condolences and offer prayer, then you have offended the memory of Christ. For it is from his mouth that he uttered no greater love hath any man than to lay down his life for his friends. If your response is to inform your children on how to appropriately respond to the policing of their bodies by persons believing themselves to be both sovereign and superior, then you've already forfeited your God-given right to exist as a product of God's divine breath. If you are holed up in the house, playing it safe, then you ignore Christ's words wherein he says, Fear not those that can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. See, there is no denying that Jesus was a revolutionary thinker and social actor. But what we do is we ceremoniously rewrite his story. Or is it the case that it has been rewritten for us? See, the young people that are tossing bottles right now, that are breaking glass and setting things on fire are talking to the church as loudly as they are protesting justice for, for justice in the face of America. They are exasperated. And I've witnessed their scribblings on the walls of social media caves today. Their generational hieroglyphics point to a philosophical failure that is playing itself out right before our very eyes. When the church the black church, that is, permitted the false ideology of white Jesus and erected idols within their walls. That effect damaged the psychology of our youth. When we sit in church, and he's on church fans. When America uses the name of God to justify its sovereignty in the world. When conquest and colonization occurred throughout the globe in the name of Jesus, whereby pillaging and rape and torture and murder was widespread and wanton, and we did nothing to redress it, we were bathing in our own blood. And so it's no wonder that our children see those images and believe that it is God oppressing them. Our children see that even up to today, we hold fast to those same lies that comfort us during times of victimization 
And they've now started to tell us to our face that our faith is one of pacifism and weakness. So as you sit in the comfort of your home and shake your head, bear some of the responsibility in regard to the fact that one of our fundamental obligations in being truth tellers and being the griots in our community was to teach our children that they too were created in his image and that neither God nor Christ look like the people that are harming them. That as the man in the story responded, some of them are just using our name. Our children are looking for their own reflection in their father's eyes. And we've allowed America to become a broken home. I came to tell young people of color this morning that are desperately asking, where's my daddy at? That are crying out, where is he? That he wants to be in your life. And yes, my child, you look just like him. Don't demonize our children for trying to ring the freedom bell themselves. Don't demonize our children for reaching for God in the only way they know how as they sink into social invisibility. Don't demonize our babies for fighting for justice with their hands when you won't do it with your feet. You want to do something, then dust off your shoes, old man. If you can still walk, then you can still march. If you're still in the land of the living, then finish what you started in the 60s. You can't be more physically tired than you are tired of senseless death and dying. It was the Apostle Paul that said we must become all things to all people that we might save some. And so this is the reason that I cannot fathom for the life of me why the church isn't changing. Give me that old time religion can't answer this week's query of where is he. It is a Christian responsibility to not only respond to the question, but to hold spiritually liable America who boasts that she is one nation under God. If she didn't believe it, she shouldn't have said it. And now another generation is doing the work that we've neglected and the dignified among us are being harsh and critical. They are holding her accountable for her lyrics. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. What we are witnessing is the groundswell of the hip hop generation and the violent resistance is their song. It is the rap version of Langston Hughes saying, I too sing America, I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I will be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. So I want you to understand, when you turn on the news, you see a people that arrived at the table of brotherhood only to find that their chair has been moved. But when you turn on the news right now, you see a people that can't breathe because they're holding their breath, waiting to hear the words of the old Negro spiritual free at last. And when you turn on the news, understand that there is still yet work to be done. A threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So as you sit in your homes and you watch the smoldering buildings in Minnesota, as you look at the windowless patrol cars in Los Angeles, and even the broken windows of the Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro, the unrestrained vandalism in San Francisco, the looting in New York and Philadelphia, as you listen to a president whose lips are dripping with interposition and nullification, I still believe that there is hope. I still believe that change is possible. I still believe that there are good and decent people of all races that are not only people of God, but lovers of justice, lovers of that which is righteous. And I too still dream I'm not ready to give up yet. I talked with some brothers this week that told me they've all but given up. I don't have that luxury. At the moment that I saw tears publicly fall from the eyes of women that I know are mothers to black and brown boys, I realized that I don't have that luxury. When I saw news reporters of brown skin arrested during the mere facilitation of their jobs, I knew that I didn't have that luxury. When my phone rang and people said, Dr. Lewis, what do we do now? I knew that I didn't have that luxury. 
when I saw black men openly weeping on television, some for fear of their lives and others from the realization that the narrative of this country is telling them that their lives have no value. I knew that I did not have that luxury. And so when I sat back and I pondered for a moment the question, where is he? He responded through the lips of my mother, said, I'm standing right here. I'm standing right where I was when they killed my son. I'm close to the brokenhearted. He sees our grief. He knows this pain intimately. He reminded me long before you stood with your hands in the air, my son stood with his arms outstretched. Long before there was a Trayvon Martin that was stalked by George Zimmerman, the Pharisees stalked my son everywhere he went. Before police broke into Breonna Taylor's home and shot her to death in the middle of the night during a peaceful night of sleep, my son was in the garden of Gethsemane praying to me in his place of peace as bands of soldiers arise to seize him. He certainly felt the anxiety of Ahmad Aubrey as he too was surrounded by people seeking to take his life. Long before there was a thing as double jeopardy, my son was tried six times in the middle of the night. Long before there were camcorders that captured what happened to Rodney King at the hands of the LAPD, my son was beaten within an inch of his life. Long before there was a Walter Scott that was shot in his back, my son had chunks of his back torn from his body with metal balls with spikes in them. Long before an innocent Nathaniel Woods was executed, so too was my son sentenced to die. And so there began the letting of innocent blood. Stand that when they led my son's bloody body up the road called Via Dolorosa, he felt upon his shoulders the weight of oppression in the form of a wooden beam. Know too that just as you are languishing with a man named Trump in the White House, my son fought for justice under the watchful eye of Pontius Pilate as they heaved my son's body violently upon the cross and he began to asphyxiate he had already foreseen in the future the day when they would choke and kill Eric Gardner as my son hung there fighting for his breath for three hours he like George Floyd during his tortured eight minutes called out to his mother so when you cry out where is he as though I don't know what you're going through remember I know all too well from where I'm always been. I'm standing right here in the midst of your pain. I'm feeling your despair and I'm saying exactly what you're thinking. It's happening all over again. God bless you. Good morning come to you this morning feeling the heaviness of our nation. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray now for a spirit of peace. Father, pour out now your Holy Spirit on all flesh. Pour out the blood of the Lamb from corner to corner of this nation. Imbue me now with your spirit that I might speak with the same spirit with which your son turned over tables in the temple. The same righteous indignation that despises anything that opposes the name of the Most High God. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a young black woman the age of 33 years old. She had worked a double shift and when she arrived home from having taken the bus, she stepped off feeling as though it had all been worth it. She was making her way up the short driveway to her very first home. It was a small three bedroom that she shared with her soon to be 18 year old son, Andre. 
Though exhausted, her angst began to rise up because there were no lights on in the home. I told that boy to leave the porch light on, and I know he better had saved me something to eat. She made her way up the three stone steps leading into her home. She rang the doorbell over and over, waiting for Andre to come to the door so that she could audibly tell him what she had situated in her mind through clenched teeth. When she got to her keys and pressed her way into the house, it was still. He is going to really get dealt with, she thought, because Andre was not home. She took her shower and still no Andre. She positioned herself in her chair right by the door so that when Andre came in, she could quickly grab him as she often did by his collar and threaten his existence. As she began to nod off, there was a knock at the door. This boy, now he done lost his key. She opened the door expecting to see Andre, but there stood a patrolman. Ma'am, do you have a son by the name of Andre Williamson? What has he done, she asked. Tell me what he's gotten himself into. I moved here to get him away from, and the officer said, ma'am, interrupting her. I'm sorry to inform you that he's deceased. All of a sudden, the ground quaked beneath her feet. She felt vomit push from the back of her throat, and a sudden flash of hotness filled her face. She began to collapse to the ground. The patrolman caught her and ushered her to that chair by the door. When she had come to, the patrolman simply said, I, I need you to travel with me now downtown to make an identification. Was he shot? Ma'am, let's get there and another officer will have the details. When they arrived at the morgue, some of Andre's friends fell on her breast and began to weep. What happened? What did you do? What was going on? And all of the boys were wearing masks pulled just below their chins. We were out protesting and the cops fired tear gas and we all started running and Dre fell and hit his head and then he was trampled. How did you boys even get involved in this? We were marching peacefully, Miss Williamson, because a kid from the neighborhood was murdered. Some organizers asked if we would participate. What organizers? Take me to them. But Miss Williamson, no, take me to them now. They made their way with her on foot to the Boys and Girls Club. There was a little light on in the back and the boys tried to restrain Andre's mother, but it was to no avail. She began knocking over everything in her path. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? She finally reached the man. She said, you organized this. You got my son killed. She screamed and she spat until her rage turned white hot and until the point that she could not see. And again, she collapsed to the floor. She awoke to a man putting a cold compress to her head. She was completely exhausted now and she could barely talk. How could you... Send those boys out to die. Yet here you are holed up in this office. You don't know my pain. You have no idea the pain that you have caused me. He said, ma'am, listen. The brother that set this in motion no longer works here with us. He went rogue and started doing his own thing some time ago. He simply uses our name. Secondly, I'm so very sorry for the loss of your son, but I want you to know that I do know how you feel. My son, too, was murdered. You see, a lynch mob formed and accused him of things that he simply didn't do, ma'am. They tortured my son to death. And here is something else I want to add. Much to my chagrin, there were people in the mob that I knew. So I respectfully ask that you don't tell me that I don't understand your pain. I want to talk to you very quickly this morning from a title, Where Is He? I don't have a, a tidy three-point sermon this morning as much as I'm going to deliver a homily that's rooted in realness. This mother represents every 
heart that believes upon the word of God yet feels in the core of their being that somehow God is conspicuously absent as they are being tried. Her essence aches to discover that the one fashioned after her own flesh no longer breathes and no longer is found in the land of the living. She passes out because it is a representation of the overwhelming mental and psychological fatigue felt by those nauseated by fatalistic injustice in what is said to be the greatest country on the face of the earth. And as she makes her way to the morgue, I crafted the story such that she would not stay there long because it speaks to the desensitization over the pornography of black death in this country. She is steadfast. And walking to the place where the boys tell her the organizer is in an effort to demonstrate that in the midst of the most horrific circumstances, our internal divine compass points to El Elyon, the most high God, in search of an answer. It is also indicative of the segment of our personality that lays the responsibility of human tragedy at the feet of God. She screams, where is he? Because it reiterates the feeling that somehow God forsakes those whom he loves, particularly in the moments where our losses are egregious and inexplicably cruel. Where is he is really the articulative parallel of where is God when I need him the most. When someone says, where is he? It is the linguistic equivalent of God. You promised that you would never leave me nor forsake me. When someone says, where is he? It is W.E.B. Du Bois' collective and blood curling scream from the souls of black folk that presses itself to the undercarriage of the third heaven and with one final breath says, how can you let this happen again? When she finally has an audience with this man, he is found consoling her, tending to the needs of her oxygen depleted body. In other words, the pain of her loss found her momentarily unable to breathe. Yet, here she is, seeking an answer. Her answer, as he gives it, is that the man truly responsible for the death of your child no longer works with us, but uses our name. That is theologically interwoven into this story to demonstrate that every evil, every temptation to steal, kill, and destroy, every soul that's been stolen, every contemptible act of amoral and immoral trespass committed with indifference to the divine right to live, liberty, and justice, in what you call earth, but what the spiritual regard as the first heaven has been carried out by the God of this world. And so when it happens that she levies with the lips somewhat of akin to that of Job and his friends, the accusation or the accusatory posture that you don't know my pain, he can but respond, ma'am, I've lost a son. They tortured my son for things that he didn't do. 